peace with your invitation bind us together in holy love come with your peace with your invitation bind us together in holy I'm John J. Thompson, and welcome to Treveca's Newell Hymnody Lecture, also part of our Music City Colloquies event, and uh, doing it here in an empty room with some very special guests. We have Kevin Twitt from Belmont University's Reformed University Fellowship, and singer, songwriter, worship leader, worship pastor, Sandra McCracken. Uh, thank you guys for being here with us today. Uh, this is going to be a great conversation. We're going to talk, we're going to sing, we're going to listen to some great music. We've had this series of events uh, usually taking place in a chapel service, talking about hymns, uh, the Newell Hymnody Lecture Series, uh, and it's been all kinds of different things over the years. But hymns, sometimes when people hear the word hymn, who knows what they're thinking? You know, uh, I'm thinking, I grew up in the Episcopal Church, so I might be thinking about when I was in the the little choir, you know, as a kid, I might be thinking about when I was in the pews. The hymns, some of the hymns made sense to me, some of them didn't. Uh, but it, but some people might be thinking about uh, something very old and archaic. Some people might be really excited because they love hymns. Uh, what we're going to try to do today is we're going. I want to talk about what is a hymn, what makes a song a hymn, what are the values of hymns, what what do they mean to us. And then how can we actually mine hymns uh, a little bit more intentionally? And, and what I'm so excited about is that uh, here with us, we have people who are experts in this and practitioners in this. So this is not going to be mere theory. And we're not really just looking backwards. We're also looking at today and the present and tomorrow. Uh, this, is, this is stuff that's highly relevant to our lives as believers and as worshipers, as songwriters. Uh, I, I'm really excited about it. So thank you guys for being here uh, with us today. Kevin, let's start with you. Tell, tell me a little bit about what you do and your background and how you got so involved with hymns and uh, just a little bit about yourself. Right. Okay. So I went to a, a place, I w was raised in the Episcopal Church as well, actually in Baltimore. Um, got converted through a parachurch ministry, went off to a place called Berkeley College of Music, um, moved here to Nashville to be a recording engineer. And then, you know, we met when I started playing in a Christian band and um, you were still a teenager, you know, so that's that kind of true. fun. So, <laughs> that was uh, like seven, eight years yeah, ago. Yeah, that was like seven, eight years ago. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I did that for a while and then felt God's call to go off to seminary. And at that point, really thought music was, I was kind of done with music, right? Um, but then when I came to Nashville, back to Nashville, to do Reformed University Fellowship at Belmont. Um, actually, my first year there was her first year. Um, I met Sandra in St. Louis when I was in seminary. We got to know each other a little bit. I tell people I would have this regular conversation with students, particularly students that had grown up in church, um, who felt that the doubts and struggles they were having meant that maybe they weren't Christians. And as I leaned into that, I realized that a lot of what was kind of messing them up were the songs they were singing. 
And so I found I needed to find some songs that were more honest about struggle and more explicit about the gospel because the songs really were kind of modeling for people what the normal Christian life felt like. And it wasn't necessarily lining up with typical Christian experience. And then we kind of started... an example of that real quick? Yeah, sure. There just wasn't much space for lament. You know, we're talking 1995. So, you know, you've been around for a while. You'll remember the kind of songs that were even being marketed as college worship. Um, It was a lot of how I feel about God. It was very little uh, how God feels about me and what he's done. It's quite a contrast to the Psalms, which rarely tell us to praise God without giving us a reason, right? Wow, yeah. and, um, and so I, you know, I, I found, actually, I had this old hymnal. Um, and this old hymnal, you can see how it's been fixed up. This thing is from like 1806. Wow. And this leather patch on it's probably 100 years old. And I just started looking through there, and I found a hymn like, Dear Refuge of My Weary Soul, uh, by a lady named Ann Steele. I didn't know who that was, but I just was like, man, we've got to figure out a way to sing a text like that. And hymnals before the Civil War don't have any music in them. They're just the words. So that's what we started doing kind of in our REF group, in our college Sunday school class. Sandra was part of that from the beginning. Yeah. Did they not have the music in it because everybody would have known the music, so they didn't need to have it in there? Kind of. You know, John Rippon, who put together this hymn book, um, he did publish a companion tune book, but not very many people would have needed that or would have that. Um, generally, if you know a tune for Come Thou Fount, Rock of Ages, and Amazing Grace, you can sing three quarters of English language hymn books with those three meters. They and that's kind of what they would do. Up. Yeah, they would, have, they would maybe know a half dozen tunes, and you could sing most of the hymn book to those tunes. So there was a kind of a, a different purpose, you're saying, for the, the hymns in that book than the purpose for a lot of the Christian worship songs maybe that are being used today? Um, that's maybe good, not purpose, but yeah, different way question. that they were being used? Well, certainly the way, yeah. Like one of the reasons that books like this are usually falling apart is, and, and the reason it's small is you would take it to church. You would have your own copy. They wouldn't have copies at the church. That meant you'd also bring it home. It was family worship. It was private devotion. So the, the physicality of this object is a really fascinating study. There's actually a recent book just on the hymnal as an object and the way that shaped culture. Wow. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, we were doing that kind of music for about five years in our Sunday school class, kind of this little countercultural community. And then we're like, maybe we should record some of this music. And, and that's where you met Sandra. Uh, I had met her already, but she, I think she had just graduated. And we had a friend that gave us a studio. And so she was usually available at the last minute. <laughs> I'd be like, somebody canceled meeting on me at this coffee shop. So, uh, hey, we could go do a vocal, you know, and, and we'd meet at the studio and we'd, you know, record it bit by bit. And that, that was in uh, 99, 2000. It was called Indelible Grace. And um, when that came out, the response of people really got me thinking more about why it had resonated with people. Maybe what it is that hymns do how they work, and uh, we'll get into that yeah, later let's today. Get, let's get yeah. to that in a second. But Sandra, um, tell us about your background and your singer-songwriter. I know you were in Nashville and you were uh, on an artist path, but what what drew you into hymns and uh, this path and as well as into Kevin's orbit and the whole indelible grace thing? There's definitely some dovetailing with the stories. And I... Um, I think I, well, so I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and I grew up in a singing hymns from the hymnal. My mom took us to church every week, and um, we just had the hymnals in the pews, and I would sit even during the services and just like kind of pour over those words, especially like I would just kind of, I enjoyed the poetry of it, really, and the music as well. I was like, I started playing piano when I was about eight years old, taking lessons. So... um, That was a place where I think I was starting to pay attention to the words, the poetry, and how that would give me language for expressing how I was feeling. So some of what Kevin's describing, even like the Psalms, the the Psalms Mm -hmm. teaching us this emotional range. um, And then then I saw that reflected also in the hymnal. So um, that was really um, kind of an early part of my story. And then once I got to college and became, like kind of set out on this path of singer-songwriter, I don't know that that's what I expected I would do, but as I did more and more of that, I also loved, you know, Dylan lyrics and all the old folk songs and just all 
kind of all of that richness of language um, fed into my work and in, in, as a songwriter. Um, and then we, the Indelible Grace music was coming out of our devotional college Bible study experience, which was either connected to Reform University Fellowship or um, just our Sunday school class at church. And, um, and we'd sing all these hymns with a guitar. Um, so we do all eight verses, which shows, again, this range. So you could be feeling, uh, one week you come in and you're feeling like the doubt of, you know, the second verse. And another week you come in and you feel like, um, you're feeling more like verse four. I mean, just like, <laughs> just catching you at these moments in your life. And the spirit, I think uses like God's spirit uses those words to, um, even because they're so closely tied in with the scripture, you know, that these words then spark things within our souls and things that we need to hear. And it can be conviction or it can be comfort or it can be, it could be all kinds of things, you know, a question that we didn't know we had. So, um, so I love the hymns and they, and Nashville has been a place where there's a community that has really formed and this become our common language. Even some of the words like these, you know, some of the words in the hymns are so strange. And then we find ourselves saying these strange words in conversation because we're like, you know, referring to an Ebenezer that's from come thou fount of every blessing. It's like, no one uses that word. But as we expand our hearts to make space for these words, we also find that our human experience um, we just have more to draw from and more to share with each other and more of a shared memory that's a collective memory that like that old hymnal that you carry around in your pocket. It's like, we're sort of doing that too with these songs um, as a people in an embodied way. I think there's something about the incarnational aspects of like folk music, hymns, and the way the gospel ministers to us by way of these these little vessels, you know. It's interesting because I think a lot of a lot of people probably assume that hymns are less relevant than contemporary songs because the language might seem more archaic and contemporary songs are so easy to understand. It's kind of counterintuitive if you approach it from a strictly modernist perspective mm -hmm. to think actually it might be that the hymns mm -hmm could be more relevant in some ways. Uh, that's really interesting. Uh, when did you first try to write something that you thought was hymn-like? Hmm. Um, well, you'd encourage me to do that for years. Do you have, have you ever thought around that? Well, <laughs> I mean, um, I was gonna, I was gonna mention this. Yes, please. This book, Gatsby's, right? So um, the first one that I wrote was in 1995 at a conference. Um, guy named Jack Miller had put together and he had us try to sing this Charles Wesley text, Arise, My Soul Arise. And the tune just didn't seem to fit the exuberance mm -hmm. and the joy. So that was the first one I wrote in 1995. And then I quickly realized that there was this thing called Gatsby's Hymns. This is an old English Baptist book, has about a thousand hymns and um, no text. I mean, just text, no words. Mm -hmm. It's also a jumbled mess. There's no organization to this. But the, part of the genius of that is you just have to read through this book and discover things. Yeah. And so I realized yeah. I could buy a bulk, you know, order of these, and I gave it out to all these students in our group that were singer-songwriters, mm. kind of hoping that they would come up with some tunes. Because sometimes I would be like, this text is great for what I'm talking about today, and we can sing it to come now found, but if somebody wants to take the Xerox off paper and come up with a tune, maybe we could try it again next week. It's great to be in college ministry because you don't get the complaints when you change the tunes that you do. <laughs> if I'd been a worship yeah. leader at church, it probably would never happen, honestly. Mm -hmm. There would have been so much pushback, right? right. But we could just try things. Mm -hmm. And even and it if, wasn't like you were asking them to sing Amazing Grace to a different melody or something. Now, later they did that because were, they got their the, feet under them, but you yeah. were giving them really obscure texts I, that nobody... Yes, yeah. well, it, it took a little while to realize that. At first, there were some that were obscure to us, but other people did know them, and I did get some angry emails. Uh, so I've tried to go deeper into texts that have completely dropped out of use that we wouldn't be able to sing otherwise, like Ann Steele's work. But yeah, I would give this off. And I know I've heard Sandra tell the story about, yeah. you know, calling up Katie or, or somebody and be like, I've, I got dibs on this one. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, calling out a number like, okay, I'm working on this one from Gatsby's, <laughs> you know, so, so that we don't, do we don't all write the same, like different tunes and move them yeah, different that'd directions. Be but yeah, I mean, so it started it can, by writing melodies to existing text. That was your um, foray. Yeah, into that it. was probably, especially in this, in this time period. Although I do, when I go back and look at the Trinity hymnal I had when I was in high school, I would, I remember early on trying to set a new tune to Oh Love That Will Not Let Me Go, which mm -hmm. is not the tune. I mean, Chris Minor's tune. I know, that's so, that we, isn't that so, so funny? You know, but, but I was already, there was some foreshadowing of, I loved that text, you know, and um, George Matheson text. And, and so, um, and then I think doing this together as a community gave me mm -hmm. permission to say, that that's, mm -hmm. keep, keep doing this, like learn how to do this. There was, you know, Kevin's gift of that hymnal to me and just the permission that that gave to go and to do that and to practice it. Yeah. So Kevin, what would you say makes a song a hymn? Ah, it's a good question. I'm going to get, I'm going to paraphrase one of my favorite quotes because I should have written it down. Um, but there's a guy, Eric Routley, who is one of the great hymnologists of the 20th century. He's passed away now. But he has this great, great line. He says, hymns are songs that unmusical people can sing together and poems that unliterary people can enjoy together. Oh, wow. Say that, that again. Say that again. <laughs> well, it's, I've got it. Uh, the second part I don't have quite right. But, I, but yeah. yeah, they're songs that unmusical people can sing together. Right. And they're poems that unliterary people can enjoy together or say together. Yeah. Right? So there is something about it being more like folk song, ideally. Um, even though in our day and age, it's kind of evolved this odd thing that m words that were written for the poor, people like Isaac Watts, Charles Wesley, William Cooper, John Newton, they all write explicitly about how they're toning their poetry down to the level of the common people. And yet we've kind of evolved to a point where the music mm -hmm. that they're often set to is seen as more elitist. It's odd, right? That's, and that's why that's I think- It's just a cultural thing though, right? That's yeah, some a, of it is yeah. a cultural thing. And, and there's all kinds of, you know, highbrow, lowbrow, that whole distinction, how that emerges in the 19th century. We're not gonna get into that. Um, but it is a very interesting thing that's happened. And some of the criticism we've got for doing folk songs to, to, um, to old hymns, I've always thought was kind of ironic because, um, Oh, what is that book? Honky Tonk Gospel. Do you know that book? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In the intro, um, you know, the, the writer says, you know, every distinctive American musical form uh, originated with poor people in the South. And so I'm like, why not put the music that originated with poor people to, to words? And also folk song, the words are really focused on. That seemed like a good musical style for this. And honestly, you know, what's an interesting thing is um, if you go way back to Anselm, who was the pastor who influenced Augustine so much, he could have written hymns in classical Latin meter, but he actually chose a popular Latin meter, which actually becomes the meter of popular English ballads. It's why you can sing Gilligan's Island or sea shanties to so many hymn tunes is because they all are rooted in that popular musical form. But a lot of times the history of church music isn't told that way. But let me just say one more thing about tech, the technical definition. There's two parts to it. Um, the first is the uh, form. You have verses, right, that are organized, you know, usually four, six, eight lines. And then it's strophic. So it, it repeats those same lines. You don't have a refrain or a chorus. And that's often confusing to people because songs like On Christ the Solid Rock are not technically hymns. They're technically gospel songs. And I don't know when we take a hymn and then put a chorus to it, I don't know what it, what it makes. It doesn't fit any definition right. anymore. And, and we've done that a bunch. Uh, the other thing is the theme develops. Gospel songs don't tend to have development. And sometimes it's kind of a Trinitarian development. Sometimes it's chronological, how this truth was true then. And then when I came to grasp it, and it'll be true when, on my dying day. right? But there's usually a development, not just a focus on the same idea over and over. The first thing that you said about it being designed for community and accessibility, oh, sure. yes, that to me immediately makes me think of my relationship to popular music mm. is very insular. It's very much about my favorite songs in my headphones, yeah, and I love this song and I sing it yeah. now. We go to concerts and we sing yeah. as a yeah. as a tribe when we're a fan of this band or something like that. It's certainly a communal aspect to it. Yeah. 
But that's a pretty modern phenomenon. It is. And, and commercial music now that has, and it's, I'm not criticizing it. I'm just seeming, as, we're, as you're saying that, yeah. I think there's probably a functional difference from even a compositional orientation to say, if I'm writing a song that is very personal and it's about me and my feelings and my communication with God, that's going to probably even on a compositional structural level be different than if I'm intentionally writing a song that's designed to be singable yes. by a group of people who are not musical yeah, that's right. and poetry that's able to be understood by people who are not literary. Wow, yeah, that's, they, that's I, pretty I, Yeah, I want to say one thing, and then Sanders should definitely speak to that, because that's a very challenging goal, and it's a different goal than a lot of other kind of music that she writes, probably. So, you know, a good hymn will be uh, understandable the first time you sing it, because as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we should be able to say amen to what happens in the worship service. We should understand it, but it should also repay singing it over and over again with new depth. And that's why paradox is a great device that hymn writers use, because you get it, but you don't fully exhaust it, right? And that's why those economy of words, you know, like Charles Wesley says, being source begins to be in one of his hymns on the incarnation. I mean, you can think of, you can chew on that for days and not get to the bottom of that, right? Um, there's really only been two hymn writers that were actually great poets. It's very difficult. Most great poets write too high. And, um, and, and I think Sandra could speak to that particular challenge, you know. I think on a personal or practical level, when I started writing hymns that I wanted people to sing with, I, I didn't realize immediately because I was approaching it as a singer-songwriter with my own voice that I didn't realize that that would actually be a barrier because my own inflection or the style or the way I would sing it was actually a hindrance for a group of people to sing it. So <laughs> I'm, I've really ho hopefully like made an effort toward more singable melodies. And, um, and I think that's like part of the process, even just of like the maturity of, of making art is that you, you go from like, I want to express this to like, I want to share this. And I think when hymns do that, you get this more communal result when, when you're able to sing it together. And a, and a good example would be thy mercy, my God. That's a song that, um, has a natural lilt. And when I sing it, it can be so much so like initially when we recorded it, it's like, Oh, that's, yeah. that works. And then, and then you get in a congregation and people don't quite know where to put the right. syncopation. So some congregations, when I travel around, will sing it with a certain inflection. And then I try to fall in with them to where I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, living into the, their own experience of that song. <laughs> that sounds yeah. really kind of like existential, but it is, it is meant to be sung together. And so hopefully as I've moved toward the, some of the later songs, like We Will Feast, it has like a more of a circular inviting. You don't have to have heard it before, like you're saying, right. to experience it. And, and I'm comforted by the fact that you don't have to be a great poet to write a good hymn. Yeah. Like that you Sometimes can write. Sometimes barrier. I mean, write, <laughs> like, sign me up. <laughs> so, yeah. but it is, I mean, it's just, yeah. I think that's an invitation for everybody to participate in this and to um, be part of this work. Yeah. I like to remind people, most hymn writers are known for one great hymn. Hmm. <laughs> you can count on one hand the number of hymn writers that you know more than one of their hymns. You know, so because I remember we had a conference in 2002 at Belmont, so and this guy, Bruce Hindmarsh, did like, explored all the poetry of When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And I remember looking at Sandra and, and Matthew Jones and some of them, and they're, they're, they were like, like, why even bother? <laughs> like, if you it's actually dig cute. into... The, the mm -hmm. poetry and the way that's crafted, it's, okay. So he's like, you know, just a freak. Charles Wesley, you know, wrote 6,000 hymns, and he writes in over 20 meters, mm -hmm. you know, when most hymn writers can use two or three. There are those kind of crazy people out there, but most hymn writers are known for one hymn. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an invitation to add your voice. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not something that's going to last forever, it's really mm -hmm. special to the community. And you've probably seen that, yes. you know, when you were leading worship, right? I, I want to talk about writing and how we can learn how to apply this in our, in our next segment. Okay. But before we get down that road too far, this kind of is making me think that hymns might have some secret hidden power to actually help teach us about certain elements of what worship is actually about in an era when maybe we lose track of that. Um, would you say that, I mean, you've been a worship pastor yourself. 
uh, do you think that hymns reveal something about the nature of, of what worship is and might help us remember something about worship or even learn it if we haven't been taught that before? I've, I had a, I've had an experience of, of leading worship regularly in a small congregation for, for about five years. And one of the things that was beautiful about the hymns during, like, during the formation of that community was that they were a shared, like when you can find songs that we know together. So some people were coming from a more um, like more mainline background or some, I mean, just really across the, across the lines of different denominational backgrounds as we gathered. And the hymns were a way of figuring out what our songs are. And so when they were able, when you're able to find that, um, it was very unifying and even healing because sometimes you have an attachment to a hymn where you don't like it for a certain reason, but then you be, begin to hear the story of someone who does have a, a, a deep affection for that hymn and you begin to love it. And I think that's the nature of singing together. Yeah, you're kind of preaching my sermon, but it, it wasn't, it, it really was something that I just kind of figured out afterwards. There's more an intuitive yeah. sense of like, oh, it's song like Dear Refuge in My Weary Soul. Like I remember when I first found that text, at first I was like, you can say that in church? Like, and somebody put that in a hymn book, but her hymns have dropped out of use as the theological kind of ideas shift over time. And, um, you know, I, I remember in college reading an essay by C.S. Lewis called On the Reading of Old Books, where he argues you should read two old books for every new book because it helps you see past your cultural blinders. Like, if you're not exposed to other ideas, you don't even know right. how to question your own assumptions. And so you sing a song like, Jesus, I, my cross, have taken... Like, that's not about let's end this pain as quick as possible. It's like, how might God want to meet us in this? It's a very different question. Yeah. So, yeah, I think when that first and double grace record resonated with people, that I was like, why? Like, what was it? And um, I remember about that time finding a sign in an antique store that said, my grandmother saved it, my mother threw it away, and now I'm buying it back. And it really felt like that's what was happening when she was a college student is that the boomers had been like, we don't need that stuff. And so many you know, of those students in the 90s, early 2000s were like, no, I really want to know what, made, what resonated you know, with my grandparents. And um, it, there is this retrieval kind of thing that's going on. And, and people will, you know, like you know, looking for old hymn books and ransacking them for, for texts that have dropped out of use, like that thrills me. Um, not that they're all better. Like, there's some really bad old hymns. <laughs> they really are, right? Yeah, I give you yeah, Sometimes we that think that something bad. is yeah. just great because it's old. <laughs> yeah. 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 We, have to, we have to discern yeah. all right. the time, regardless yeah, yeah. of whether. Yeah. Well, you know, the most famous example is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. It was originally, the original title was Hark How All the Welkin Rings. I, I yeah, yeah. Those. George Whitfield changed it. Charles Wesley wrote it, and Charles, George Whitfield changed it, you know, and... I've got lots of other examples of really bad lines from <laughs> hymns. You know, I, it's always a fun part of my hymnology class. You know, there, we have one that we recorded on a double grace record. I don't know if you know this one, but it had a line: "Christ, our Paschal meat, uh, was roasted in the flames." Oh my <laughs> wow! So we changed that. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, "Rock of Ages" is another great example. Not the one we're going to sing a little later, but the original Augustus Top Lady, "Rock of Ages." Um, had a line, when my eye strings break in death. And it was changed to when my eyes shall close in death. Yeah, it's graphic. There's like this tendon that, that dries up and snaps and your eyes roll back in your head. That's, okay. Some, some people Gratuitous, need a rewrite. Maybe, some people Lord. need a rewrite, yeah. Too much information. Where can somebody who's maybe just, this is new to them, this idea that, that hymns, can be exciting. Hymns can be a, a source like this. You talk about people ransacking antique stores looking for him. Um, that might be a step farther down the path for some folks. If somebody's watching this right now and they're saying, oh, uh, I'm hungry for this and I didn't even know I was, what's an accessible source for somebody to maybe go find an introduction to some hymns that are going to add some depth and resonance to their worship uh, what's a good entry point for them? Do you, do you have any advice, either of you? Well, you should listen to her, you know, last couple <laughs> records. You could listen to the yes. Double Grace music. I mean, I, I like the idea of modeling. You know, this is what maybe one way to do it. 
but I also love for people to take the idea and incarnate in their and incarnate it in their own context. You know, I've even had you know African American congregations be like, you know, okay, you're not going to do this style, probably not your musical heart language, but the idea, you know, maybe you take the idea and flesh it out. So if if you're asking about a source for text, um, a great place is the cyber hymnal. Just Google cyber hymnal and then look at the titles. And if a title intrigues you, click on it and then read it. And if it continues to strike you as saying things in kind of a fresh way or maybe having a topic that seems to be underrepresented in worship, that's kind of what I do. You see this, you know, all these little pieces of paper in these hymns. Like I just read through this. I'm like, ooh, that's kind of a fresh, original way to say that. I mean, it's 200 year old, but it, to us, it, mm-hmm. it seems like a, a, a striking way to say something. I'll just kind of mark those, and then when it's time to do another record, I'll send out lyrics to a bunch of people that I know that are writers. Be like, hey, let's you know try that. That's kind of been my process. Yeah, there are more and more people I think that are sharing and doing that. I mean, I think of our friend Bruce Benedict, who's been mm. kind of curating this. Is oh, it yeah. still under Cardiphonia? Is that yeah, the Cardiphonia? Best place? Yeah, he's That's, got all kinds of projects. Yeah. yeah, I feel like he he has done a great job of um, of just like bringing people in and and sharing about that. And you can search by topic or by you know mm. um, time of year, like church calendar, those kinds of things, which can be really useful if you're a practitioner and you're trying to kind of bring some new things in. So mm. One thing I've found is I have to approach looking at hymn texts differently than looking at worship songs and, and commercial songs and pop songs. Pop songs are so easy to understand. It's kind of like taking a spoonful of sugar or something like or a bite of a candy bar or a cookie. It's not like a real sophisticated thing. You got to wonder if you're going to like it or not. And sometimes looking at a hymn in an old hymnal, it, it has that smell and that texture and it, there's a little bit of romance to it. The cyber hymnal thing is a great resource, but it's one of the most outdated looking websites oh, yeah. ever. Right. Like the HTML on it is from 1995 or something like that. But if I take a little bit of a beat and I, and I remind myself of the words, or if I have to, I just copy and paste them into something, change the font, whatever I got to do. I kind of remember... If I was looking at a painting at the Art Institute in Chicago, I wouldn't just rush by it and glance at it and keep moving and expect, oh yeah, I I just appreciated Mark Chagall or something like that. I would stop and really contemplate it. And I think that commercial music and just the consumption of commercial art, it's trained us to consume stuff in a certain way. And so sometimes approaching hymns takes a little bit more of a devotional approach. Uh, it's the same way we read scripture sometimes. We're just, we've got very easy to read translations and it's, it's very accessible. We got an app for it. And so we just, boom, we just read it and move on as opposed to meditating on it, taking time. And, and so sometimes with, when I'm looking at hymns, I have to take that extra time and do it a little slower. And, and at first, it's, it's hard for me. I don't like to sit still. I'm sitting still this long to talk even with really yeah. interesting people. I feel like I got to get up and move around because I'm a little bit hyper that way. When I do, though, the reward is really worth it. And I find that, that there is something there. And then when I go find the story behind the song and who wrote it and when they wrote it, it's really rich. That's when the, the payoff is so worth the investment you say you're teaching a whole course on this now. So in a nutshell, if someone was to study, I mean, some, someone might be saying, you can just take a class on this. Like, What is just a, a brief overview of the scope of what somebody would study if they wanted to take a whole course or study hymnody? Yeah. You know, the textbook that we use, it's a standard textbook. It's called Sing with Understanding. So that we kind of follow that. So it starts out with what is a hymn? How do hymns do theology? How is hymn writing, an example of biblical interpretation, and then mechanics, meter, poetic devices, um, that kind of stuff. And then I tend to just go chronologically through that because it's fascinating. You know, a good hymnal is one of the more ecumenical things that you'll ever be involved in. You know, most people kind of are in their little tribe, but if they sing from a good hymnal, they're singing hymns and songs from across the centuries and even 
uh, across different cultures more than they probably will in any other kind of way. Mm. So I try to point that out as we're going through the songs. And, um, and one of the other great things about studying hymnology in that historical way is you hear the voices that often are overlooked in church history, particular women and lay people. You know, you tend to study church history uh, as a way of studying the great theologians and the church councils and miss kind of what were the things that were forming and shaping ordinary people's lives. I think that's one of the great things about studying hymns. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, we're going to do another segment and we're going to talk about putting this into practice. And I think some of that will come up. But uh, is there a song that you could share with us? Would you maybe introduce it? Tell us about the song you're going to do to close this segment out. Um, sure. I mean, if it's all right, we should do Dear Refuge. I, oh, okay. I think that could yeah, be just, we've kind of referred back to it, but it's one yeah, yeah. that I feel like it kind of resonates a lot of the things we're talking about. The beauty of being able to express ourselves before God and the permission to do so. Mm. And it's one of Kevin's and it's just, and it's one I've been singing. So just as a participant in it, it's just um, one of my favorites. So is this one that you wrote together? Okay. No, the text I found in this book, okay. and I put the tune to it, and then she recorded it as a mm-hmm. piano vocal on the first Indelible Grace CD, and then she's been kind of singing it ever once, sang it at the That's Ryman when we did the hymn sing there. And, That's yeah. great. All right, well, let's do it. Dear refuge of my weary soul, On the wet waves of trouble roll, my fainting hope relies. To thee I tell each rising grief, for thou alone canst heal. Thy word can bring a sweet relief for every pain I feel. But oh, when gloomy doubts prevail, I fear to call thee mine. The springs of comfort seem to fail, and all my hopes decline. Yet, gracious God, where shall I flee? Thou art my only trust. And still my soul would cleave to thee, the prostrate in the dust. Has thou not bid me seek thy face? And shall I? seek in vain can the ear of sovereign grace be deaf when I complain no still the ear of sovereign grace attends the mourner's prayer oh may I ever find access to breathe my sorrow So oh. 